All right. I really like this intro, by the way. Hi, everyone. How are you doing? All good? Yeah, I hear that's good. Very nice. So how are you enjoying the conference so far? Yay! <laughs> like it. All right. So I'm very happy to see so many faces over here. And I'm very glad that you decided to come and join me for today's session. So as you probably know, um, Media Simink is ubiquitous. So we listen to our favorite songs while running or sit on a train. We watch movies and TV series with family and friends. So nowadays, with the increasing um, number of content and devices, providers must keep pace and provide the most efficient and smooth playback to all users. No matter where they are, no matter what devices they use, and no matter what content they listen to or watch. Additionally, they also have to stay compliant so that no content can be distributed without producers' consent and knowledge. So, if you've ever wondered how the world's biggest streaming companies stream their content, you're at the right session. Because today, we are going to learn how the modern and adaptive streaming works on the web. But before we jump and start exploring, I will just quickly introduce myself. So, my name is Kasia. I'm a software engineer working at Spotify. Um, my team and I develop an SDK that powers Spotify player on the web. So, it's basically a JavaScript library written also with TypeScript, let's put it. And uh, we communicate directly with the browser API to play content. And uh, I'm originally from Poland, but I'm currently living in the UK. And uh, yeah, I like playing board games and watching movies and TV series, which you'll probably notice from the slides as well. So the agenda for today is as follows. First, uh, we learn how to ensure a smooth and efficient playback. And here we'll cover some topics such as segmentation, adaptive bitrate, uh, dash protocol. There's no slides. There's no slides. <laughs> well. Maybe I can turn the laptop. <laughs> yeah. Something is happening. Yay! We are back. All right. The previous slides were like boring. It was about me and also the title, so really never mind. But going back to the agenda. So we will talk about how to ensure a smooth and vision playback. And here we'll cover some topics such as segmentation, adaptive bitrate, dash protocol, and media source extensions. Later, we'll turn all this like theory into action. So we'll see how it works in a demo part one. Later, we'll talk about the license content, where we'll see how to encrypt and decrypt the content using encrypted media extensions. And again, we'll see how that works in action. And last but not least, we'll just do a quick wrap up just to see, um, just to basically summarize what we have learned today. Also, small disclaimer, so I won't really talk about the Spotify internals today, but rather a standard way of streaming media on the web. Cool. So, are you excited, just like I am? Yay! Nice. All right. So, smooth and efficient playback. This is like the most classic example of how to play a video. I bet that you have probably seen it many, many times and maybe even like uh, played with that on your own. 
And why this example is very classic and very easy, because we just take the HTML video element, we just take the media file, which is mp4 in this case, Big Bug Bunny mp4, and we assign it to the source attribute. It's very easy. But with this approach, we have two issues. First one is that we don't have much control over playing fraction of data. And the second thing is that it doesn't support bitrate switching. And these two are very, very crucial when it comes to ensuring a smooth and efficient playback. And why is it like that? Well, for the first case, um, the current HTML media elements already support like being able to download like a partial content thanks to X range um, requests. And this is cool. But the problem is that they don't give you much control over how much data we'd like to download, how much segments, it's, if it's like two or 10 or five. No, this is like done by basically them. And you like to have to have you like to have this control because depending on the browser or the platform or the device, you may actually like some, you know, like uh, adjust it from time to time. This is one thing, but also regarding this, um, this criteria, some of the CDNs or servers might not even support the X range request at all. So in this case, the browser, what we'll try to do, um, will try to download the whole file prior the playback. So if you imagine like it's a very long and high quality video, then we may actually wait a while. So that's the one thing. The second thing is the bitrate switching. And in order to explain you how important it is, I will just give you like a real life example. So imagine that you are sitting on a train and you are watching a video and suddenly you are enter, you're entering the tunnel and your bandwidth and internet connection drastically slows down. Have you experienced that? Yeah, of course, almost everyone. So the thing is that at this point, you may notice that the video also worsened a little. And this is because the content providers try to fit into your current bandwidth and switch between bit rates, just to still provide the content without stalling, buffering, or even completely stopping the playback. So this is just to like the best user experience, just to still like watch the video and not, um, yeah being disappointed of having like a playback being stopped completely. So these two, as I mentioned, are very important for the smooth and vision playback. And this is uh, what we are going to uh, try to solve because at this point we don't support any of these two, right? And um, uh, that being said, before I jump into this slide, I just wanted also to mention two things. So first thing is that I'm going to focus on the MP4 format today because it's the most common format used in streaming and it's also very easy to manipulate. So you can find like uh, lots of tools uh, available online or being able to, to download on your local machine ready to use and basically manipulate with the MP4s so like uh, remove one stream or add another and so on and so on. And the second thing is that um, I'm going to focus on the video today, just to make things interesting, because in the demo you will see like a video as well, not only hear the sound. But overall, all the commands that you will see today that I'm going to use also apply to uh, audio-only files as well. And now going back to the slide that you see here. So this is the structure of the MP4 file. MP4 file consists of atoms. So all the peculiar abbreviations that you can see here are called atoms. We have ftip atom, which is the file type. We have movie atom, which is uh, movie metadata. And we have mdat atom, which is basically a payload of video or audio. And now if you would like to somehow move towards the idea of being able to download like a partial of content, we have to somehow split it in some way. So the very first step is fragmentation. So once I decide to fragment this file, I will notice some differences. And the first difference is that we'll get the init segment and a bunch of media segments. Now within uh, the init segment, we have the ftip atom and movie, but inside the movie metadata, 
we'll also have the MVEX atom, which stands for movie extends. And it basically indicates that at least one of the streams got fragmented. Now, when it comes to media segment, we'll have two atoms, which is move and m dot. Move is somewhat similar to the move um, atom in the in segment, but it's only for that given fragment. That's why we have f at the end in the name. And m dot, um, it's again like a payload of audio or video, but of course it's also like dedicated for that given segment only. It only like contains partial content. And here it's also very worth to mention that the current segment doesn't have to know anything about the previous or the next segment in order to be playable. The only information it needs is the need segment, and that's it. And this is how it looks in reality. So I took a screenshot from one of the tools that I'm going to show you today. And as you can see, the Big Bug Bunny MP4, um, I put it there, and it has three atoms, ftip, move, m dot. And after the fragmentation, I got something like this. So as you can see, the very first two, which is the ftip and move atom, are the init segment. And then we have pairs, move, m dot, move, m dot, move, m dot. I could go like that all the way down, but I don't want to sound like a broken old record. Anyway, you, you get my point. All the like move and m dot are the media segments in this case. Cool, so at this point we have a file, we just fragmented it, but we still don't support any of the two criteria that we just mentioned in the very beginning. And uh, this is because even though we fragmented the file, it's still a single file. So in this case, what we have to do and what we have to use is a streaming protocol. And there are like two, um, the most common streaming protocols out there. One is MPEG DASH. DASH stands for uh, Dynamic Adaptive uh, Streaming over HTTP. And it's developed and uh, by the DASH Industry Forum. And the second one is HLS, which is mostly developed and invented by Apple and stands for HTTP Live Streaming. So today we are going to focus on MPEG DASH only, just to speed up things because I don't have like many time to cover both. Um, but yes, so with the MPEG Dash, what we will get, we'll try to like split the file into physical smaller pieces. So how does it work? Is that we still have to fragment the file, so that's what we have already done. And after that, I'm using the MP4 Dash command from Bento 4 tool. And once I run it, I got something like this. So as you can see, I have two folders audio and video for audio and video streams, respectively. And additionally, I got the stream MPD file, which is dash manifest. I will go back to that in a second. And uh, when it comes to the folders itself, if I enter any of these, then I will get like a bunch of smaller files. So the very top one, I hope you can see it, is the init MP4. And then we have seg prefixed uh, media segments. So what we did, we took the file, we fragmented it like the structure, and then with the um, with the MP4 dash command using the dash protocol, we physically split it into multiple pieces. Now, when it comes to the stream MPD file, this is like quite interesting because this is like the manifest, and uh, then the manifest is like. Um, recipe of how to play the content and where to find it. And it looks like this. So um, the, the very root element there is called MPD or Media Presentation Description. And it contains some information like a title, duration, and so on. Then inside, you may find one or more periods. And period is a time window within which we expect the content to be presented. So usually, it's only one period. But there might be many if you'd like to, for example, insert, um, if you would like to allow for the uh, dynamic content insertion, such as ads, for example. Then within a period, we may have one or more adaptation sets. And adaptation set is like a representation of a given content. So if we think about the video, and um, as we know, video has like two streams, like audio and video for uh, sound and uh, image. 
these still will be described into separate uh, adaptation sets. So this is basically what the adaptation set is about. And then inside we have one or more representation element. And the representation is basically like a version of a given content. And the best use case when we have many representations is when we actually support adaptive B traits, which we also see uh, later today. Cool. And this is how it looks in reality. So as I mentioned, it's a XML-based file. And we have the MPD element. Then inside we have one period. Then we have two adaptation sets, one for video stream and one for audio stream. And then I mentioned, um, ah yeah, and then we have one representation in each, which basically means that at this point we only support one bitrate. And now, in the very beginning, I said that the manifest is like a recipe of how to play the content and where to find it. So here I highlighted some information of how to play the content. So these are MIME type and codex, and this information I use while creating the HTML media element. So what I'm doing here, which I will show you later as well, I'm telling the browser what content it can expect to be playable in a second or so. And when it comes to where to find it, here I highlighted some other information. And as you can see, there is a segment template element. And we have initialization and media fields. So if we replace the representation ID with the ID that I have below, then we'll get an exact location to the init segment in this case, which will be video slash avc1 slash init.mp4. And this is the exact one that we have seen before. And this ex exactly uh, the same thing applies to media segments as well and also to audio stream. Cool. So um, this is great. So we've just uh, fragmented the file. We split it into multiple pieces. We now have the manifest as well to know how to play it and where to find the content. But the two examples that we have seen before uh, won't work anymore for us, right? Because uh, they um, only expect that we'll assign like a one file, not many files. So at this point, we can't use anymore this example. And instead, we have to use the media source extensions, or MSE in short. What does it mean is that we still have to create the HTML media element, which is like video in our case. But then, instead of assigning the media file to the source attribute, we have to create the media source object and then assign it to the source attribute through the create object URL. And once we have done that, then we will create the uh, source buffer and add it to the uh, just created media source. And while doing so, I have to also provide the information about the MIME type, MIME type and codex. So these were the two that I mentioned uh, that are available in the, in the manifest. And once I have done that, then I actually can start downloading all the segments from the CDN or whatever, and append those buffers to the just created source buffer. And from now on, this is basically how the whole playback works. Cool. So at this point, we can say that, nice, we have a control over playing fraction of data. Because at this point, you can like write your code, you can decide how many segments you'd like to download, depending on what, which platform, which uh, device, which, for example, browser, it's basically up to you. So this is like where we have like a full control. But we still don't support the bitrate switching. And in this case, we have to do some additional steps. And one of them is that uh, we have to use another tool, in this case called FFmpeg, for example. And with this tool, we'll encode the same file with, for example, five different bitrates. And here you can see an example of 360 kilobits per second for video and 64 kilobits for audio. So as the input, I'm providing the Big Bug Bunny, and then I'm getting the Big Bug Bunny 360. Then, um, once I encoded it with the uh, bitrate and the five different bitrates, then I have to fragment all the files that I just created. And once I have done that, then I'm taking the mp4-command, 
and I'm taking all the fragmented files that I just uh, created. As a result, I will get the audio and video folders again, just like we have seen before with the stream MPD file. But now if I enter, for example, the video folder, I won't see a bunch of files, but five different folders because I have five different bit rates. And then if I enter any of the five folders here, then I will see the bunch of smaller files again. When it comes to the stream MPD file, it has changed, of course. So now instead of one representation, we have five of them because we have five different files with five different uh, bit rates. And as you can see, there are some information highlighted. We have um, different bandwidths. We have also like different IDs. So basically, depending on the uh, current bandwidth of the user, we might start ser uh, serving the content from one or the another location. Cool. And at this point, we can say that we support both the criteria. So from now on, the playback should be smooth and efficient. Smooth like a pudding, huh? I guess so. All right, so that was it for the theory. And now let's have a look how it works in action. So I will quickly switch to my terminal. Is it visible? <laughs> Is it possible to fix it? No? <laughs> oh dear. Okay. Um, you know what? I will try to maybe tell you like uh, how the command looks like and so on. Yeah, I will figure out something. I promise. Okay. Anyway, so on the left hand side, which is not really visible, <laughs> It's my web app. And this web application uh, has two different endpoints. One of them is uh, to present the adaptive bitrate, and another one is to show the encrypted content, which we'll test later as well. So this is like the web app that I pre prepared like specifically for, for this presentation and for the demo part. On the right-hand side, these are like uh, some notes for me. <laughs> uh, but on the bottom, um, I have like a folder where I'm going to prepare the content and I know it's not super visible but uh, yeah I will try to somehow tell you what it says and hopefully um, yeah, if you have any questions just raise a hand if uh, if you didn't understand something but anyway this is like a folder where we are going to prepare all the content that will be served to the application so uh, what I'm going to do is that here which is not visible really. We have two f files. One of them is a Big Bug Bunny MP4. We have also Big Bug Bunny fragmented, and we have two folders, output bitrate and output encrypted. So well, I will enter the uh, output bitrate. And here I already prepared four dif uh, different uh, files with four different bitrates. One of them is uh, four uh, 480. Then we have uh, 2160, 1440, and 1080. So they are already there because I wanted to speed up things. And right now I'm going to encode one more to have like 360. So I'm going to use the FFmpeg, FFmpeg. And yeah, I know it's not still visible, but I will tell you what, uh, what it says. So in this command, uh, I have to provide the input, which is a big bug bunny MP4. Then uh, we have the resolution, which is like um, three, uh, 360 and 640. And I'm also providing the 360 kilobits for video and 64 for audio. So basically the exact same things that you have seen maybe uh, before on the slide. And uh, as an output, I expect the Big Bug Bunny 360p. Now there are also like two other options uh, called uh, keyint uh, min and also minus g. And they have 48 
uh, as a number provided. And these two are quite important for the adaptive bitrate, because what do they mean? So basically, once you would like to support the adaptive bitrate and you have many files encoded with different bitrates, you have to make sure that once you segment or maybe like split it into multiple pieces, all the files, they need to have the exact length. Because if you won't do it, then once you start switching between bitrates and the quality, then you will get some glitches in between or weird jumps. You know, so in this case, it's very, very important to have like the exact same length of all segments. And in the case, this case, 48 uh, is basically like uh, 30, 30, uh, 38 uh, frames because we have 24 um, uh, frame rate. So in our case, it will be like roughly two seconds for each segment. Cool. So I will run this command, which is running, and I wouldn't explain that anyway. So. Uh, that's cool. And after that, come on. Yeah, I could have a bit before I started explaining. Oh, there you go. Cool. So I've got the Big Bug Bunny 360p here. I'm not sure if it's, yeah. You can see that I just highlighted something. And then I'm using the mp4 fragment command from uh, Bento 2. And I just have to fragment the content that I just created. And uh, yeah, I'm running the command again. Then I have five uh, different files already fragmented. And as the last step, I'm using the mp4 dash command. And I'm using all the fragmented files to create one single manifest and also split all the files into multiple pieces. So again, it's like mp4 dash and then like a, a location to all the fragmented files there. So I'm running this. And then if I go to the bitrate here, you can see that something is working, something is loading. So if I uh, switch the bitrate to, for example, this one and start playing, cool. It works. And as you can see, in the very beginning, I downloaded like the very first segment so with the very slow bitrate. But afterwards, I changed it to one up, and then I started downloading from a completely different one. And I'm not sure if that will be visible, but here under the network, we have the segments. So if I go very, very up um, here, I have output video avc1 slash one, this is one. And if I change it to another one, for example, 16, then you can see it's avc1 slash two. So it's really coming from a completely different location. Cool, so that was for the uh, adaptive bitrate, which is great. And now let's quickly talk about the encrypted content. So, the um, encrypted the content is very important, as I said, because the content providers has to stay compliant. And uh, before we jump into like the encryption and decryption processes, uh, I just want to go over like a few core concepts. And one of them is DRM or digital rights management. And it's a technology used uh, to protect uh, the content from unauthorized use and control uh, its distribution as well. And there are three main DRMs out there, which are Google Widewine, uh, Apple Play, Play, and Microsoft Play Ready. Then we have EME, or Encrypted Media Extensions. And this is the API that is um, used uh, in between of the player, like your web application, for example, and the CDM module, which really decrypts the content for you. So this is like the API that allows you to decrypt the content. And CDM, just like I said a second before, it's a content decryption module. And this is the really the heart where the content is um, decrypted. So it's uh, not open sourced. It's, uh, you can't see what is inside. It's a software, it's a binary, and it also comes with the uh, browser installation. 
And last but not least, we have CNC, that stands for Common Encryption. And this is basically the standard encryption scheme uh, that is supported by all DRMs that I just mentioned. Cool. So when it comes to the encryption part, here we have again the structure of the uh, MP4 file that is already fragmented. And after the encryption, we'll notice some additional um, atoms there. And one of these atoms is called PSSH, or Protection System Specific Header. And this atom contain, um, contains IDs to the keys that will be used to decrypt the content. So um, this is like how it looks uh, in variety again from the tool. So as you can see, this is like the init atom. We have the ftip and move, and under it we have uh, track, mvex, and the uh, mvhd. And after the encryption, because that was like the normal file uh, that I split, after the encryption, I got additional atoms. So one of them is PSSH on the bottom, and then a bit above is the synth atom, uh, which uh, will take like a bigger part later in the decryption. And then on the bottom, you can also see the command that uh, must be used using the MP4 dash tool to, to encrypt the content. Cool. For the when it comes to uh, the dash manifest, um, after I encrypted it, it uh, has changed as well. So right now we also have the content protection element, and here you can see that we also have the base64 encoded information about the PSSH that again contains the IDs to the keys that will be used to decrypt the content. Cool. So um, that was for for the encryption part. And now when it comes to decryption, the next few slides are going to be slightly more complex because what I did was um, I took the whole specification of the encrypted media extensions and I tried to translate it into like a nice diagram because I found it like uh, very not well like uh, explained in some places. So what I tried to do here, I really like took all the methods all the possible like um, arguments it take, uh, they take, and also like I try to, I will try to explain all the objects that it will return. So stay with me. But if you want to understand something, don't worry, because we are going to repeat it uh, again later uh, during the demo part. Cool. So for the decryption part, we have like two types of components, and uh, in total there are five of them. Uh, those on the left-hand side, the red ones, um, are maintained and controlled by us. So we have the CDN, where we store the content. We have the web application, which is basically our player. And we also have the license server, from where we are going to serve the licenses with the keys to decrypt the content. Now, on the right-hand side, we have the green ones, which are out of our own control. So these are the browser and also the content decryption module that comes to go with the browser installation. And now, uh, in order to play the encrypted content, we first have to download it, and then we will attempt to play it. At this point, browser detects it's an encrypted content because it has a synth atom. So this is the atom that I showed you before in the, in the slide. Um, and synth atom uh, is basically the, the prox uh, protection scheme information atom. And uh, yeah, it's uh, quite important to discover if, if the content is encrypted or not. So basically, once the browser um, noticed that it's an encrypted content, it emits an encrypted event. And this is basically where the whole process kicks in. So what we do on the web application side, we call the request media key system access method with two parameters, key system and the list of configurations. The key system is like a generic term for content protection provider or the decryption mechanism. And it's usually a reverse domain name. So in this case, you can probably see there is like common wide wine alpha over there. And the list of configurations here, basically what we do here, uh, we basically ask the CDM module if the key system and at least one of the configurations are supported. So if they are, then we get the media key system access object back. And uh, there we have one method, which is called create media keys. So we'll call it right now. 
and as a result, we should get the media keys object back. And this object is quite interesting because this is like an instance that represents the CDM module. So this is like the only way how we can basically communicate with the content decryption module in this case from the uh, player side. And this instance contains two uh, important uh, methods. One of them is a set server certificate. So in this case, while doing so, we will make sure that all the messages that will be sent between the license server and the decry uh, content decryption module here will be encrypted. When it comes to the create session, this is like kind of obvious. Uh, this method will basically create a session within which we will obtain the keys to decrypt the content throughout the playback. So uh, once we've got these, then we have to assign these media keys to the HTML media element, which in our case is a video HTML uh, element. And uh, yeah, by the way, are you still with me? Yeah, cool, awesome. Uh, so after we've done that, uh, then we can call the create session. And by default, um, it, we can like uh, not provide any argument because by default it takes the temporary um, um, like type of session. But you can also create like um, um, not temporary but persistent. Thank you very much. So persistent type of of uh, session, but that requires like a higher level of security. So in this case, you can just uh, not provide anything and it will just create a temporary uh, session for you. So once we call the create session here, we'll get the media key session object back. And here I left three the most important uh, methods that we are going to use. And one of them is generate request. So generate request has two uh, arguments. One of them is init data type and need data. And these two arguments are coming from, hold on, from an encrypted event that we got in the very, very beginning. And as you can see, the uh, init um, data type is CNC, which stands for the common encryption, as we said before. So once um, once we call the create uh, the generate request, we're just passing all this to uh, information uh, as the arguments. And then this request is forwarded from the browser to the content decryption module. And at this point, the content decryption module realizes, OK, so there is like an encrypted content. And to decrypt it, I need a key. So what it does, it emits somewhat some kind of message, which loosely translated means, OK, the key is needed. And what we do on the player side, we listen for such messages through the on message event handler. So once we receive that message, then we make a post request to the license server to obtain the license. And if everything went well, we get the license back, which is encrypted, not only encrypted, but also the information inside that contains the keys is also obfuscated. So it's really only understandable by the content decryption module. So in this case, on the web application side, once we got the license, then we provide this license to the CDM module through the update method. So once uh, uh, the contract decryption module got it, then it can take it, unwrap it, take the key, and then decrypt the content, which works exactly like this. So it decrypts the frame and provides the decrypted frame back to, to the user. And this is basically how the whole decryption process works. So I know there was like a lot of stuff, a lot of methods, a lot of JavaScript methods, but yeah, we did it. So this is basically how the uh, encryption and decryption works. And that being said, uh, let's have a look how it works in action. So I will again switch to uh, my app and I will go to the encrypted content here. As you can see, I'm getting like uh, some errors, of course, because I don't have a content prepared, just like I had with the output, uh, with the bitrate before. So in this case, yeah, lots of 500s. So I will switch to the switch to the output encrypted content here. So this is the folder where we are going to provide um, uh, the content. And for that, I'm going to use the mp4 dash command. 
And um, basically this command is exactly the same as I provided in the slide. So as the input, which is not really visible, is like big bug bunny fragmented. Then there is encryption key where I have to provide the encryption key. And I'm also telling that uh, when it comes to the uh, DRM, I'd like to use the uh, white wine. So I'm just calling this guy right now. And now if I refresh the page, I'm getting some console logs, which is very good. So here, yes, it's not very visible, but as I promised, I will explain to you once again what we did here and what happened. So the blue ones are what the browser uh, have sent and the uh, yellow ones are what the client uh, basically uh, run, like the methods. So in the very beginning, we got the encrypted event here. And then we called the request media key system access with the uh, key and the list of configurations here. As a result, we got the media key system access object back. From this object, we get the create media keys here. And as a result, we got the media keys object back. And then we take this media keys and assign it to the video uh, element through the set media keys method. Once we have done that, then we take the create session from the media keys. And as a result, we got the media key session object. Then we take the media key session object and we call the generate request method with two parameters, any data type and any data. Once we have done that, then the request was forwarded to the CDM module. And at some point, the browser emitted message event, which means that the key is needed to decrypt the content. So we got this message through uh, inside the on message event handler uh, from the media key session. And in this uh, handler, we made the post request to the license server to obtain the license. And once we got it back, then we provided this license with a key insight through the update method of the media key session here. And that's basically it for the whole encryption. And if I play the content now, it should work. It works. And it's very loud, so I just stop it. And for the network again, you can see that, uh, probably you can see, yes, hopefully, we have like segments here and they are coming from the output encrypted. So this is basically uh, the, the location where I prepared uh, the content, which is great. Cool. So I'm coming back to, to the uh, slides now. And uh, yeah, that's, uh, that's the second part of the demo. So it's more like a sm summary. Um, for the segmentation and adaptive bitrate, um, as I told you in the very beginning, they are very, very important and crucial to ensure a smooth and efficient playback. Um, because thanks to them, we can control uh, how much data we'd like to download in order to, for example, start the playback or buffer. So basically we have a control over playing fraction of the data. And uh, all of them, like both of them, uh, help us to minimize the risk of stalling, buffering, or even completely stopping the playback. When it comes to the encryption, again, it's very important for the content providers to stay compliant. And uh, here we have the digital rights management. And um, this is the technology, again, that is used to um, protect the content from unauthorized use and controls its distribution. But of course, once the content is encrypted, we can still use the encrypted media extensions to decrypt the content, also with the help of the content decryption module. And here I have like a few resources for you, if you're like more interesting. On the right hand side, uh, I have like few tools that I used. Um, one of them is FFmpeg and uh, another one is the Bento4. So these are the tools that I used to either encode the content or, for example, uh, fragment it and um, also like create a dash manifest. So if you would like to play with that, feel free to do so. It's very easy to do so. And once you start, you will like really get into it. So I really recommend. Um, on the left hand side, I have two specifications that I uh, read uh, in order to prepare this presentation and also the demo. 
but I also included two other links. So the bottom one is quite interesting if you would like to learn a bit more about the MP4. Uh, it explains exactly like the, the history and also the atoms and how to play with it. Whereas the uh, one above um, is actually like a very nice video explaining how the encoding and compression works, which might be super, super uh, interesting. And that being said, uh, this is it for, for today. Um, in the right top corner, uh, there is a QR code where you can uh, basically scan it and it will take you directly to my GitHub account where you will find the demo application that I just presented to you. So you can just clone it and fork it, but be mindful that it only works on, on Chrome. So I, I did like a demo application, but it's very like limited. So well, if you have Chrome, it will work for you. And uh, yeah, feel free to, to connect with me through the LinkedIn. And again, very sorry for the low quality um, yeah, presentation and, uh, and uh, terminal. I hope you <laughs> maybe noticed like some of the commands and maybe if I uh, was trying to explain you what I'm doing, at least you, you got like the rough idea uh, what is happening. So sorry again for that. Uh, but yeah, thank you very much for your time. Thank you for coming. I'm really honored to be here. And thank you for having me. Thank you so much. All systems are nominal. Initialize Genesis sequence.